Hello, MBA hopefuls, and welcome to MBA Waves. My name is Eric Lucrezzi, your host for today. As always, joined by my colleague, Barra Sapir. Hey, Barra. Hey, good to see everyone. Welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm great. It's, um, it's great to be here. Whenever we come on these shows and we have guests from abroad, I'm always envious about being in faraway places out, out of the United States for a little bit. But I don't know when that's going to happen next. But it's great to be here and it's great to see you all. Yes, and I'm super excited about today's episode. It's the first time we're having a joint episode. Today we have Imperial College Business School in London, as well as GMAC Europe. And I'm about to introduce our guest for today. Today's episode is the future of MBAs in Europe, or graduate management education, I should say, in Europe. And so without further ado, I'm going to start with uh, our first guest, Nalisha Patel from GMAC Europe. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having well, having me and Joel on the show. It's been, uh, I know that you've had uh, some rallying to do with my um, slightly chaotic emails, but I really appreciate, uh, really looking forward to chatting today. And uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, same here. And last but not least, Joel McConnell from Imperial. Welcome, Joel. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, tuning in from uh, not so sunny uh, in the Algarve in southern Portugal. We're hosting a conference on uh, the blockchain economy here. Uh, this week. That's awesome. So um, once again, welcome to MBA Waves. And um, well, um, today's episode, as I said, is about the future of graduate, man graduate management education in Europe. So there's a lot to talk about today. Um, Barra, why don't you start us off? Sure. Well, um, I'd love to hear what's new and exciting at Imperial, Joel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, it's uh, it's a dynamic place uh, and uh, it's London, so there's always lots of things going on. I guess the so, sort of three things I would mention here, uh, you know, primarily we are sort of a science-based university, and so our research and our research centers play a pretty important role to what we do. So we just uh, had our our Center for Digital Transformation lead our delegation to the World Economic Forum in Davos. That was a big one for us uh, in the late, uh, late part of May. And then just yesterday, we announced a new uh, decarbonization research center uh, that is going to tackle climate change. And that's going to be led by one of uh, co-led by one of our directors at the, uh, at the business school. So very exciting news from a sort of research and center's perspective. Otherwise, uh, QS World University Rankings came out, uh, seventh globally from Imperial, right between Caltech and ETH Zurich, good place to be for us. And then finally, I might mention that we have just expanded our program portfolio. Not only are we doing uh, a full portfolio of MSCs and MBA programs, but we also are now offering our first full Bachelor's of Science degree in economics, finance, and data science. Great, thanks. Wow, super exciting. Congratulations on the new rankings, that's awesome. Yeah, and as we mentioned, we're also joined by GMAC. So, Nalisha, could you tell the audience a bit about what you do besides being the creators of this infamous test? Known as the <laughs> yes, the infamous test. And apologies, I should roll back one step because in my keenness to, uh, to, to say how excited I was to join you, I probably should have given a little bit more of an intro for context as to kind of my background and, and, and why I'm on the show today. But uh, yeah, just to kind of, it leads me in, well, thanks, sorry. leads me well into the question anyway. So, um, so look, I've been in graduate education for the last uh, kind of almost coming up to 15 years across numerous functions. I've been in kind of recruitment, marketing, a large portion I spent in, in the actual program creation, program delivery, program leadership, um, across degree education and executive education. Um, my last specific business school role was actually at London Business School, where I was leading the um, degree programs over there. Um, but my current role is uh, for GMAC, um, and that's my capacity that I'm here today. I've been in the role for almost a year, and I'm, you know, my, my role is overseeing our European office. So we are a US head office based organization, but we're a global organization and we have offices all around the world. So I look after the Europe team um, and where, you know, our role is to manage our European based clients who are the business schools who are looking for global talent. And then we also manage the European candidates who are looking to go out into the global business education market. So that's kind of a bit of scene setting. Um, but in terms of kind of telling you a little bit more about what we do and uh, uh, and yes, be, besides just the infamous test, which I'm of course, I'm sure all of our listeners will be by now very well aware of. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later on. But just to kind of give you a little bit more context about GMAC and kind of what we do. Um, 
I guess our overall purpose is to match talent. So our mission title is to ensure that no talent goes unmatched. And as I mentioned, that means kind of helping our business school clients find and attract talent and to reach the candidate directly and the talented uh, to connect them on their business school journey so that's kind of that's kind of the overarching theme but that kind of sits with three focuses I would say so the first one uh, which is a huge part of what we do is we are advocates for graduate education and the benefits of doing education um, and that can be you know that we see that, that that's value from people from all walks of life and I'll talk a little bit about our initiatives around kind of inclusion and diversity uh, a little later um, but a part of this advocacy piece of our uh, our organization is that we publish extensive research in the sector from uh, work with corporate recruiters, prospective students from the member organizations ourselves. We did a, a diversity report at the end of last year. And all of these are there to help the sector navigate, adapt to the challenges and the opportunities that kind of we're faced with as a, as a whole. As I said, we are cross industry and we're an advocate. And so we partner with all sorts of industry friends, I'll call them, and push forward um the 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 agenda and the advancement of our sector um you know whether that be hosting conferences or events or partnerships or kind of featuring with uh with, with good friends such as yourselves today to talk about kind of the benefits of going into graduate education um the second part of that is uh helping um clients find excellent candidates like people like yourselves who are listening in today so whether that be if you register your interest through one of our channels kind of either mba.com or the test or business because or through the mba tour um we help people be able to find you so that's that, that's a, a key part of that matching service um, and then the third part is, of course, the assessment. So, of course, we, you know, we have the GMAT. We do have a number of other tests as well. Um, and look, we're very well aware that, that this is one part of the admissions journey. Um, and it is a part that is often the kind of, let's say, the, 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 the only w one comparable objective data point um, often in an admissions process. But our core part of the business is to ensure and we this is a key part of our business, but we do that in a way where we're trying to ensure that we develop and evolve our testing to ensure that um, that it's meeting the needs of the market, the business goals and the candidates. So, um, so yes, we can talk a little bit more about the test in a moment, but just to kind of give you that uh, the, the full picture of, of what we do, because I do think it's a lot more than people think. Yeah, and Alicia, I mean, th thank you for all that. Super interesting for uh, me. <laughs> Uh, first of all, and Barra is working in test prep forever. And I think a lot of people, most people don't realize all that GMAC is doing. It's so much more than, you know, a test that scares the crap out of people. <laughs> um, and, you know, the branch of Business Because, which is a great source of information about schools and careers afterwards to the MBA tour, which is a amazing platform to meet schools and get to know, you know, admissions officers and so forth. So that's really interesting. And thank you for that contextual intro. <laughs> Yeah, I'll turn it over to Barrett. I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, there. well, I just want you to know, I've been working with the GMAT for decades now, and I love the test. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I, yeah, you know, being so scared. It's like, it's like, I always tell my, my clients, like, every question is like being on a different dance, right? And so like, that's how I approach the test. But we could talk about that later. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the future of graduate uh, education in Europe. And specifically, what prompted the two of you, GMAC and Imperial, to come onto MBA Waves today together? Either one of you. I would, I would, <laughs> just say from my side, listen, beyond being a, a absolute fans of Nilisha and her London-based team, uh, GMAC is obviously a, a critical partner to business schools, uh, not just in the UK, but globally, of course. And, you know, we engage with GMAC in all the sort of, you know, expected channels, GMAC, MBA Tour, Business Because, and, and other channels as well. Uh, but we also engage with GMAC events worldwide, uh, regional, as well as sort of annual conference, for example. And then, you know, Imperial College Business School staff do sit on, on special advisory groups as well. Um, I will also say that uh, in the past, uh, our vice dean of education has sat on GMAC's board. And uh, this year, specifically, I was on uh, the advisory board for the leadership conference as well. So we're big fans of GMAC and, and the team here uh, there in London. Anything else you should add to that? I mean, that was so complimentary. I, uh, I, I echo <laughs> the sentiment still. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's absolutely imperative that for us and for all of the reasons I talked about, um, you know, previously as part of that kind of 
advocacy advancing the sector. It's really important that we are really, really collaborative and engaged with everyone in the sector. Uh, and, you know, Joel's team uh, work very closely with us, as I said, as do many of our key business school clients. And they have various different roles, which are kind of, you know, part of part of the evolution of GMAC and GMAT as well. So, uh, so yeah, it, you know, we, we we are often at conferences or uh, or on panels and things together. And uh, we thought that we kind of uh, the last time we connected, we were talking about some very similar topics. So we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to to kind of fuse them together. Wonderful. It's great to have both of you. Thank you. So, guys, and this is really to either of you, what are some of the major trends, opportunities, or even threats to education in Europe as the two of you see it today? Well, I, I think this is a great one for Nalisha, given the research they, they just published. <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, I'll try not to take the rest of the hour. I'll try and let you. Uh, I'll try and let you say something, Jolie. Eh? Um, so look, I think it's uh, it's been a super pivotal time in the GME sector. Well, for the whole planet, right? It's been a really pivotal uh, point in time, and you know, I think for for graduate education, the choice for candidates has grown so much, not just the size of the market with so many people doing some, you know, more interesting things, um, but the type, the format, the style, traditional, non-traditional, micro, stackable, online, hybrid, you know, there's so much out there. And, and COVID's high in that, but also it's really um, shifted for many people their own priorities and their own um, goals. What are they looking for? What, what What's going to give them purpose? And I think where we sit is kind of in that interesting, exciting time where, yes, you have all of those things. You've got the you've got opportunities and threats as well as uh, as I guess I'm. You can often spin uh, spin opportunities and threats in both ways, right? So we'll t I'll talk about them more specifically as topics, and then delve within kind of the the, the things that need to be thought about within within those. Um, but we, uh, I mean, I recently worked on a on a report which has actually been super interesting, super exciting, um, and it were it's called the future of graduate management education as envisaged by the European deans. Um, so it was based on um, interviews with 19 of the top European deans. Um, and it was trying to understand what they thought, you know, what they thought was coming up, what they thought was needed in the sector in order to, for it to kind of advance along as at the pace that is required in the world of business, in the world of business and society. Um, and, you know, I, they summed it up in in the report, we condensed it into about in, into five themes. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll run you through a couple of them, which I think are really kind of poignant. And, and I'd also add a couple of my own, which I know that uh, that Joel has some um, some thoughts on. So I'm sure that he'll be able to kind of pick up from from there. But, you know, I think that the, the, the one around the, the first one that came out was, of course, digitalization and technology. And I think that it's not that's again, none of this is that's not a new concept. Right. But I think for business schools who uh, who were offering very traditional face-to-face -face, um, on-campus uh, MBA programs. That was a big shift, you know, that was a big shift in um, in how they delivered education. And I think, you know, I think the, um, you know, the trend there is really looking at how, how it's utilised within that face-to-face -face environment. So, yes, you know, we, the, there is... There is still huge, huge benefit in being face to face. And in fact, I think there's lots of things that you can't replicate in the online environment. Um, but for me, I think that it was kind of that recognition that, that that's a baseline now. So it's how you then adapt your content, your pedagogy, your uh, your outputs and, and in and around that and, and your experience, your user experience. What does that look like? Um, you know, it's, it's not good enough to kind of hodgepodge things together. Um, for me, though, on this, the kind of key trend is around how we are not only utilizing, thinking about teaching, but how are we uh, as an industry planning for the, you know, the, the, the societal shifts that technology such as blockchain, metaverse, um, more work around data privacy, you know, what will that do for our society and the future of work? So when we're thinking about everyone going into these programs, because they're thinking about what they want to do with their careers and how they'll be lifelong leaders, what does that look like? How can we plan for that? So I think that's a really key trend and um, and one that really needs a lot of focus, you know, both both from candidates, from the business schools, but also as the industry as a sector. Um, and I think kind of leading into that a little bit is the the kind of 
the the theme around business for society or business for good or and I'm wrapping a lot of things into there I'm wrapping kind of CSR ESG ethics I'm, I'm, I'm kind of using it under this umbrella for the purposes of kind of not taking up two hours of time um, but you know I get I think you know as we have seen and continue to see the impacts on um, society the planet etc of 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 having a of having a, a a business world where the bottom line is the fundamental um value um output and i think that it's great to see that uh that learners want different that many corporates want different and so that kind of pushes um that pushes the sector not only to think about what they're teaching in terms of content and i know imperial have some great content to talk about here um but also how they behave as a as an as a company themselves, um, and so I think that's a really interesting um, element of that. Uh, the other one I will just pick up um, on quickly is that concept of, and this again, it's been around as a concept for a long time, but this concept of lifelong learning, and and actually what I mean is this need to ensure that you can adapt and top up and know how to continually evolve. Um, because that's really what's going to make uh, a, a leader. Um, that's what makes a leader. And I think that's what's going to be even more important in leadership roles going forward is how, we, how are we equipping leaders to be able to connect the dots, deal with ambu ambiguity, plan for many scenarios and be ready to kind of do all of those things, not be an expert in every single area, but understand how to talk the language of, of all of the different elements that are involved in making a decision because it no longer exists within kind of, you know, okay, this is going to happen and this is going to be the output. It has all a myriad of different outputs. So I think those are the kind of challenges that the sector needs to navigate and is navigating. I'm seeing some great pockets of amazing innovation happening at the business schools. And I think this is really what the benefit of going into graduate management education is to give you that time and capacity to, to, to take a step back and look at all of those things um, as we go into, uh, you know, an even faster moving, even more complex um, environment. That, that seems like a, that's Never. amazing. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> amazing to hear all that. I mean, it's it's super exciting. And I love hearing how the the academy and the, the affiliate organizations that are working with the academy is that you're really thinking about these things. So thank you for that explanation. And I'm going to punt it over to Joel and say, how is Imperial using, you mentioned science earlier, right? That you're mm -hmm. got a lot of science in your, in your program. So how, how are you responding to these trends in the industry and uh, overall? Yeah, no, listen, I think uh, if you haven't read that report and you do have an interest in sort of what's happening, what the future of European uh, GME looks like, it's excellent. I can say maybe only complement it with the, the recent employers uh, survey report that's come out as well. I mean, those are two pieces that I would definitely check out if you're sort of trying to get a handle on what's happening in Europe and what might employers be expecting at business schools. I think that links back to what we're doing in Imperial and certainly a lot of top business schools are thinking about right now is how do we better manage an end-to-end -end student experience or student life cycle? And of course, relating back to sort of digitalization, how technology might help us uh, offer improvements that are scalable across, you know, increasingly large uh, program portfolios and numbers of students for, for having back on campus now. I think one of the things we're, we're trying to do in Imperial certainly is to take advantage of, of the parent university and, and the resources available there. So when you think about sort of our MBA programs, uh, giving uh, sort of access to the broader innovation infrastructure at the university is one way that we can sort of offer something different and competitive versus other top MBA programs and, and schools, uh, especially for those students that are maybe curious about or committed to launching new ventures, taking new research to market or simply going down that sort of entrepreneurship, uh, corporate venturing track once they return to the labor market. So thank you, Joel. Um, so I wanna just jump into this next idea because for those of us in the MBA world often talk about finding the right fit and there are tons of fantastic MBA programs out there but each of them has their own you know, unique flavor of delivering the nuts and bolts of an MBA and a lot of it comes down to culture. So Joel, could you please tell us about the culture at Imperial? 
Skeleton, when I think about uh, the culture and peer, there's sort of uh, three things I, I would mention. There's sort of the essential element. Nine out of 10 students at Imperial uh, College Business School are international. Uh, and certainly I think candidates, regardless of where they come from, really are attracted to that academic excellence that is sort of what Imperial College of London has built its reputation on. And specifically at the business school, uh, it's that fusion of business and, and technology advantages that we can really offer here at, at Imperial that makes it sort of a standout option for top candidates. And the sort of final bit of that sort of essential elements is South Kensington location. It's a really beautiful place to come to your MBA degree in London. Um, the second bit I would mention is certainly related to entrepreneurship. You know, Imperial College Business School is very much uh, a key player in the Imperial Enterprise Lab. Uh, it's a college-wide initiative, so it's not just sort of an incubator for the business school. The idea is we bring together engineering, natural sciences, medicine, and business school uh, stakeholders, let's say, to work together to launch new ventures or scale new ventures, and certainly the Enterprise Lab is a, a key way or central point of coordination for that, and that will be something that will be different uh, at, at the business school. Um, we obviously have our White City campus, uh, where we have the iHub and, and our new satellite campus for the business school as well, uh, located in in scale space. So again, there is quite an ample infrastructure on entrepreneurship. So, you know, I think a lot of business schools talk about entrepreneurship, but we can offer a sort of that technology infused business and STEM background and access to resources that perhaps you know, other cultures can't have that same claim to the way we do at Imperial College Business School. And then finally, I would say that, you know, for us, uh, co-curriculars really are, are critical uh, to the broader teaching and learning experience. And we decided that the best way for us to deliver impactful co-curricular activities were to merge careers in our student life team. So that everything that happens out of the side of the classroom, let's say, has some coherency and is coordinated so that we're working on not only the hard skills and the academic learning, but also giving them access to a broad portfolio of sort of uh, transformational experiences they can use to really meet those career opponents at graduation and sort of scale those after graduation as well. Joel, I thought I might ask, like, if you want to expand a little bit about what White City is. So I think they, sure. they kind of went by fast and... Uh... So, so fun fact about Imperial College, everyone thinks about South Kensington because that's sort of, you know, what they know. Uh, but I think the Imperial College has something like nine campuses uh, across London. Seven of those are medical teaching facilities. But White City is where uh, it's sort of a part of London that's really being redeveloped. There's a lot of big corporates that have gone there. And the idea is to take applied research, work with industry, and sort of rejuvenate that part of the city as well. And so Imperial College has a two-part campus, a north and a south campus at White City. The north part is pretty much all built out. Again, a heavy focus on scientific research and applied research uh, for this sort of the sciences. Uh, but on the south part of that new campus we have at White City is where we're building up the new uh, business school and other facilities as well. And there's a, uh, an organization called Scale Space that's sort of an incubator that is partnered with Imperial College. And, and part of their building there is actually business school teaching and learning uh, space as well. So students can both study at South Kensington, but uh, on some occasions, we do take them to the White City location as well. That's good. And with the deep I, roots I in like... Sorry, Alicia, go ahead. I was just going to jump in and say I um, I visited for the first time a couple of months ago and I was just so impressed because it's been, even though it's probably only been like a year or so since I've been in that area, like it's so, uh, it's so developed and it's got such a nice kind of like, it, you know, I want to say innovative feel, but, you know, it's kind of got that startup vibe and it's got lots of like creatives and, and people who are kind of interested in, um, you know, in, 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 in trying new things and um, experimentation. You've kind of got that. You can feel it in kind of all of the kind of coffee shops and the restaurants and things. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. Now, we even have a new Soho House location just down the block. Yes. Oh, <laughs> nice. Okay. You, know, you know, it's made it when a Soho House pops up, right? <laughs> right. So would you call this a good of a Silicon Valley of London? This area? There's tough competition for that. I, I imagine our friends in Cambridge would, would make an argument that they're sort of that area. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, technology and innovation that's happening in and around London. I think it's a great place to come do an MBA just because yeah. of that. So much investment right now in that. Nice. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the admissions process at Imperial. I'm giving uh, a bunch of airtime to Joel. I think uh, <laughs> this has turned a little bit. So many of our listeners today are thinking about applying to your program. So what should they expect? What are some suggestions you'd like to offer in, you know, in terms of being a great applicant for Imperial? Yeah, no, for me, it's uh, what, what, what can applicants expect? I, I would hope that they would expect extensive engagement uh, between that first indication of interest they might have sent us about a potential interest in studying with us through to uh, support uh, as they work to submit a complete application form, uh, as they complete their admissions interviews, uh, and as they meet other requirements, such as submitting a GMAT exam. So lots of engagement. I think we really tried to uh, 
take the approach that that initial interest to working through to actually having an offer starting with us is, is a broader onboarding experience and sort of really thinking in smart ways about how to offer richer onboarding experience is something we're really focusing on in my unit in marketing recruitment admissions. One of the things we have done is sort of uh, put additional resources uh, into the team. And so we have a, a new candidate experience manager whose job is specifically to make sure that there's a better orchestrated onboarding experience. And particularly once candidates have an offer and as they wait to actually join uh, their program and be on campus, let's say. So uh, lots of support and engagement uh, all along the process. Uh, I think we are quite clear about what the requirements are and how the process works. Uh, and then, of course, once you know candidates uh, have made it through the application process successfully, they can continue to expect support right up until they join us for study here on campus. Nice. Sounds Neat. pretty thorough, accessible. Well, well, how about how about GMAT or the executive assessment? How is that factored in? And and someone actually from the audience, Thomas, um, colleague of ours, has asked about test waivers, so we can probably fold that in as well. How important are they? In the application process. Yeah, it's, it's interesting with the, the GMAT exam, uh, it's only technically required on a couple of our programs, uh, but a lot of people still take the, the exam to send it to us as an, an additional sort of reference point, but it's not it's not formally required, for example, for our finance programs, mm -hmm. but a lot of finance programs still send the GMAT exam. Um, I, I would say that what's useful about the GMAT, uh, and particularly for programs where it's required as part of the process, is it gives us a sort of standard set of indicators we can compare across candidates, across geographies and industries and sectors, and of course, previous areas of study. So, you know, for us, uh, being a school that, you know, what looks at transcripts quite closely and previous academic performance, and particularly in the quantitative space, it's, it's, it's quite important for us. Uh, I would say those indicators that we're watching through GMAT, and particularly for the ranked programs where we do actually require the GMAT exam, provides a very helpful and complementary source of indicators for us to look at as we look at building cohorts across our 20 or so programs that we have in the portfolio now. Great, thanks. So since this is MBA waves and our focus is largely full-time MBA program, the, just to be clear, I'm pretty sure the GMAT is required for that program. For the full-time MBA yeah. program and for our MSc yeah. in international management. Okay. And for the exec, you have an executive MBA as well, I believe. And that one is the EA that you use? Yeah. And we, they have the we accept it without a formal requirement. Okay. Nice. Do you, do you accept the EA for your, for your full-time MBA? Some schools do that. Uh, we do not. It must be the okay. GMAT exam. Okay. Thank you. And that made me think of something else. Like say somebody's, you know, uh, university grades were not the best. Uh, can that be, you know, offset by a great GMAT score or is, is, What's your take we're, on we're, we're pretty we're pretty strict on uh, previous study pr uh, and performance at the undergraduate level, and I, we we're pretty transparent about what we require. So, you're, if you have any doubts, of course, you can get in touch with us as a candidate. But I think we're pretty clear on what those requirements are. So, uh, I think the GMAT's a helpful addition, and we certainly pay attention to it for those ranked programs where we require the the test result. Yeah. Uh, but we are certainly going to put you know a special emphasis on previous academic performance and then for the full-time MBA, you know, what the professional experience was after graduation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when COVID uh, hit the world, you know, several schools around the world um, did a temporary waiver for the GMAT. Some decided to keep that. Some have accepted alternative tests, either their own in-house one or LSATs or Series 7 or something like that. Is that the case? Is, are there any, uh, like, waiver possibilities for the ranked programs? Generally, no. Uh, we, we're pretty insistent on having a GMAT exam. Uh, certainly, there's you know, special cases that come up, but generally, it's it's a standard requirement for all applicants to our full-time MBA uh, and, of course, our MSc in management program. No, fair enough. That makes sense. So coming back to Nalisha, maybe you could tell us about how GMAT partners with business schools around the world um, to create an assessment experience that is a that is as efficient, equitable, and comfortable both for applicants and institutions alike. Like, and second to that, maybe honing in on the relationship with Imperial specifically, because Joel's here with us today. Sure. Um, I guess. I mean, if I, was, I, I guess I'll start off by saying, you know, and, and kind of following on from from what Joel said, you know, the no one ever got in with what with just their GMAT score alone, right? So this no. is a, it, no. all admissions processes are holistic and they're all tailored to the program and to the um, institution that you're going to and, and they will all have different requirements. So, you know, I think that sometimes there is a danger to, um, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to candidates before who've been like, oh, well, I got a, um, a 650, I'm never going to get in. And, you know, that statement is, 
is problematic because there are plenty of great applications that I've seen. There's plenty of great students and alumni I know who had 650, less than 650. And so it all kind of depends on your, your entire application and who you're going to. And that's kind of why it's really important to do kind of the exploratory work and to kind of have the conversations and, and explore the right programs um, um, and for you. So, um, so I guess uh, that would, I'll just start off with that. But I mean, ter in terms of the kind of partnerships, like it, it feeds into that really. It's the, the reason we are so engaged with all of our kind of, you know, all of our member institutions and, and, and even those who are, who are not are, are to understand what is it that you're looking to measure from a, from a student? Because of course, there's the, the element, which is a key element. Is, are they going to be able to academically complete this program? Because you know, we don't, we're not setting up people to fail here. Um, you know, this is a big undertaking to undertake an MBA program and it would be irresponsible to, to take people on board who, you know, there wasn't that confidence that they'd be able to manage because that's unfair on both, both parties. So, you know, there is a, um, there's a there's a constant, you know, as we've Giles touched upon, you know, we are, you know, we have various different, you know, focus groups, committees, we have working groups, people, our business skills schools meet with our psychometricians, our product teams, um, you know, there, there is constant engagement in how we um, develop our services and our and our products and our assessment um, you know and I think that that includes some of the you know you mentioned a little bit about inclusion and diversity you know we have offices across the world so we fee we bring in that voice from global um, candidates and schools so you know not just from the school side we often are uh, conducting kind of anonymous and um, uh, anonymous market research into the candidate space, as well as direct candidate research. Uh, and so we're always looking to understand, you know, um, motivations. Uh, we're trying to understand uh, kind of variances in, in where kind of certain regions, um, it, you know, do uh, perform in different ways. So we're always trying to understand those kind of elements and feed that into how we develop our test. You know, we want this to be a, uh, continue to be a tool which is uh, valuable globally uh, because it takes yeah. in those factors. Um, so yeah, so that's a really important part of what we do. But just to comment on that bit, I mean, it's very interesting because the GMAT is American originally, right? As the MBA is an American thing from, I don't know, 70 years ago at this point, it's become a yeah. phenomenon. It's been massive in Europe for a long time. I think INSEAD was the first one uh, in 49 or 50. Um, you have about 30% of the top ranked FT MBA programs represented in Europe and about 20 in Asia at this point. There's been a lot of growth in Asia. Um, and it's very interesting that you mentioned global offices, which can really take into account feedback from, you know, I guess institutions, but also for test takers, perhaps. I don't know if that's part of it. Yeah, to make sure that it is inclusive and not favoring, you know, uh, not, of course it's in English, right? Um, so there's already the hurdle of somebody, say, from Korea that has to take a test that's far from their language, that's in a language far from their native language. Um, but there's a cultural element, right? So to the questions that's, it's been a subject over the years and it's interesting to hear that you've been it addressing has. that that way. It's very encouraging. Yeah, and, you know, equally, you know, we, we I've just kind of, I know because uh, Barrow loves the GMAT, you know, equally we're taking on board feedback from, you know, you know, we, we're, we're very aware of kind of uh, test prep organisations and working closely with them to understand what feedback they're getting, um, as well as, you know, we're very aware of, um, you know, people, industry friends across, um, whether that be publishers, journalists, you know, we are constantly taking it, taking on board what's, um, happening in the marketplace as well as the kind of direct feedback and needs of the marketplace as well. Yeah, I think I think starting about 15 years ago, I started going to meetings in New York that it, it was GMAC and a whole bunch of test prep companies that it was it was this lovely meeting and a lovely dialogue back and back and yeah. forth that that you guys hosted, which was I think it was really the first of the test prep companies that I experienced reaching out to. Mm. To, or test companies reaching out to test prep companies. So we really appreciated it. We really appreciate those dialogues, those conversations. Of course, we always want to find out little tidbits, right? Of course. <laughs> Are there any that you can share with us? <laughs> it's, it's, it, you, this reminds me of it, you know, in no way as glamorous of, uh, and I don't know whether people are watching Stranger Things, but it, it reminds me of like, Hopper's being interviewed quite a bit, isn't he? And they're like, so what's happening in the next season? <laughs> I'm like, oh no, exactly. I exactly. <laughs> What's on the next test? <laughs> um, look, what I will say is, you know, we, uh, 
and as I have said, without you know being too much of a kind of elusive uh, in you know interviewee, um, we are continuing to continuing to evolve our products and services in all spaces. Um, we you know the you've mentioned a little bit about inclusion and diversity, and that is something that's really important to us and something right at the forefront at the moment. Um, we just launched. Um, in fact, we just had the first round of applications for uh, a talent and opportunity scholarship. So we're welcoming people. We're talking a, a lot about people coming into graduate management education from underrepresented groups and uh, for me I think anyone can identify as underrepresented so it's open to all um, but with the aim of bringing in kind of people from non-business backgrounds more women um, people from LGBT communities socioeconomic diverse groups so we really you know we want to encourage that this is a space um, for lots of different people. And what we're doing as part of that scholarship is not just offering the test, but we're offering the support along the journey. So for example, you will have access to prep, you will have an admissions consultant through your journey, uh, you'll have access to a wellbeing app as well. So there's lots of things that we, we understand it's not just the test itself, there's a whole part and process of that build up to going to business school, even if you know, you're, 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 you know, you are, um, you know, you're well versed with what the, the different properties of uh, of information are. Um, and so um, not to evade your question, because I, I wasn't doing the politician's answer there. I wanted to make sure I talked about the scholarship. But, you know, as part of that, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we will continue to um we are continuing and we've got some things in the pipeline which will help our that matching service even better. Great. Thanks. <laughs> so thorough answer. I love it. Thank you. So <laughs> maybe some like logistic things like, you know, in terms of like visiting campus. Joel, if people want to come as interested applicants, are they welcome to visit campus at this point or is it more by virtual? You know, obviously since COVID things have shifted. Where are we at now? People who want to check out Imperial. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's a great question because I think a lot of schools now that, uh, you know, things are opening up again to decide how much outreach do we want to do, how much on campus do we want to do. I think what we did learn under the pandemic is that we can do digital uh, engagement first and do it well and see good uh, engagement numbers. So I would say, you know, what's the purpose of an on-campus visit? Certainly there are sort of more general events for uh, candidates that are earlier in the phase of deciding whether or not the institution is right for them and the business school and our programs are right for them. Generally, I would say, you know, we try and host on-campus uh, activities that are very sort of action-oriented. And so sort of admissions days where so a candidate has sort of submitted their application can come through and complete their final stages of that admissions process, aka interviews and things like that, hear from faculty, experience the physical space on campus to make sure that we're the right choice for them if they indeed are made an offer for the program. Um, having said that, again, there are some general activities where earlier applicants can come visit us, but I think we're trying to focus on sort of more action-oriented uh, events when they do come on campus. Uh, we are continuing to do a lot of digital outreach. Again, nine out of 10 students that are at the business school are uh, international, so digital is quite important. And then some markets, we are starting to get out there and put some some boots on the ground again and do face-to-face -face activities. Like we're getting more creative, I think, about how we do that as well. So we recently hosted an event that was sort of live streamed from London to Singapore. We leveraged alumni support on the ground there and we're able to have a team in London sort of virtually participate in that event for offer holders in Singapore as well. So I think we're, we're open to creative options. Candidates are welcome to come to campus. I think candidates should ask themselves, what's the purpose of coming to campus, to campus especially if they're coming from abroad? Uh, and to not shy away from digital engagement uh, by online events uh, as well. Sure. So part of what I'm hearing is it kind of depends where you are in the process, if it makes sense to come in person or not. And there's more and more digital opportunities to, to do that. And let's face it, it is kind of a luxury to visit campuses if you're coming from abroad, right? Not everyone has the money or time to, to do that or, you know, time off of work so, and so forth. So, and there's a carbon footprint as well, I guess. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You talked a bit, Joel, about being really interested in, in like, I don't know if you called it the lifespan, but the span of the student. Um, yeah, the student, the end-to-end uh, -end student experience or the student life cycle. Right, the student life cycle. So I want to just hop to the other side of that life cycle and talk a little bit about the the ROI. It's a small fortune to go to business school. And what about careers? So can you talk a little bit about um, the career services at Imperial and what can graduates can expect in terms of employment opportunities, both for the local applicants and the ones that are coming from abroad? 
Yep, no, absolutely. And I think depending on the market you are uh, applying from, uh, whether it's a, it's a two-year program or a one-year program being the sort of established norm, I'd say the advantage of coming to a school in the UK and indeed Europe is a broader region is that typically programs are in a, are shorter and in and around a year in duration. Certainly that's the case uh, at Imperial College Business School. Uh, so less time out of the marketplace, uh, less expense from a tuition fee perspective and cost of living expensive. Uh, perspective, sorry, but it does mean you need to get a whole lot more done in, in just 12 months. Uh, and so I would say that one of the areas that we particularly excel uh, at the business school is uh, the career uh, services. And again, that's sort of joined up with our our student life offering. So I'll, I'll sort of summarize, you know, the basics of what we do. I, I will mention that we are an MBA CSEA member school. And so we're constantly benchmarking and talking with other top business schools to understand how we can continue to improve the way we help students ultimately obtain their career outcomes at graduation, but scale those outcomes over time as well. So pre-program, uh, we have a careers primer and you as an MBA student do get to meet with one of our careers consultants as you onboard to the program. So it starts before you can get to campus. And so what we wanna make sure is that if you have to be in and out in about 12 months, that there's proactive thinking about how am I going to develop my career? How am I going to use the MBA experience and, and all those different things I can do in the co-curricular space to really to, you know, get to where I want to go professionally afterwards. Um, one of the key things that our career and student life area does is the is off a personal leadership journey at PLJ. And that goes uh, in tandem with another program we have called LEADS, which is sort of about leadership skills and ethics training. Uh, but the PLJ is offered by our careers team specifically. And that's really about self-awareness. It's about career strategy and it's about professional development. So it's sort of like a, a, a curriculum that runs along the sort of teaching and learning curriculum the content of the program. So it's like a big deal for us. Um, then other services, again, we offer tons of activities and ways to engage with the careers team. We obviously have careers consultants. We have the career induction day. We do strength scope. Uh, but so the other interesting sessions we have, uh, executive impact and presentation skills. We do industry insight sessions. Uh, we give students, uh, MBA students, access to headhunter databases. And so we do a lot to support them while they're actually on campus. We do, being a school that's sort of about STEM and business, uh, work with a partner called BMOC. Uh, they have a great platform to you where they use AI to sort of benchmark at an individual student level and uh, with an understanding of what sort of other students' career outcomes were and how you can sort of tweak your CV to make sure that you're positioning yourself accurately. Um, and then, of course, uh, we uh, have the advantage, I think, in the UK today where students that come and do a full-time program are able to stay on for a, a, a period of two years initially as well. And so that makes it kind of an attractive des destination to come. And so if getting some international work experience uh, as part of your MBA here uh, in the UK and at Imperial, there is that ability to stay on afterwards as well. So we do a lot of employer relations work to make sure that if you do want to stay in London and work for a bit, that we've got good and helpful and established relationships with employers uh, in and around London as well. You know, speaking about careers, I wanted to kind of spin back to Nalisha. Like, you know, the GMI is obviously a very important assessment thing. I, I like the way you, you kind of spun it as it would be irresponsible to admit people in without being sure that they can handle the coursework. It's very true. It would be a waste of everyone's time. So obviously, it's very important for the, the entry point, right? But what about leaving? What are some of the implications with respect to the GMAT and careers post MBA or master's degree, do you think? I think you're on mute. Let me just unmute you. Oh, I think you have to do it. Apologies. Um, uh, so yeah, on the, uh, on the GMAT side, so look, some employers do look at the GMAT score. They use that as a, as, as part of their, you know, you've seen, I've seen it with a, a number of the consulting firms. Um, but you know, the, why, I guess wider than that, you know, we, um, there are a number of arms in which we support that kind of career exploration because well, it's part and parcel of your business school or exploration, I think, is is understanding what career that you are looking to, to go to and whether that business school can support that journey. Uh, and so that's why we, you know, where, that's where I think some of the, the other arms of GMAT come in. You know, we have... Um, you know, we have uh, business because, you know, they put, we, you know, there is, they have a fantastic team of writers and researchers who kind of are always looking at that kind of that ROI perspective. What is it that you're looking to get from which business schools, which business schools, do, you know, are kind of working very closely with certain sectors or employers or or. or, or or uh, topics. Um, we then also kind of can give a bit more guidance, I guess, on, you know, we work, as Joel mentioned, actually, that we we have a corporate recruiter survey. So we, um, 
you know, as the title says, we survey a number of corporate recruiters uh, to try and understand what it is that they are looking for from um uh, from candidates and 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 so that is something that is used from both business school side less or so on the candidate side I think but I would definitely encourage people to go and have a look at that because there is you know that there are things in there which uh, you know it's divided by certain sectors it's divided by country you can have a look at uh, information and they're based on kind of you know um, uh, certain preferences that that sectors and, and, and regions have in terms of um, employing people. And I think those kind of things are really useful as well in, in supporting your business school decision. So, um, so all, I guess, part and parcel of, of, that, of that experience. Thank you. Thanks. So I want to, I want to go back to the, the end part of the life cycle of the, <laughs> of the student at Imperial, um, Joel. And, I, you know, I hear that really a school can be measured by its alumni, right? That's, that's what um, students are looking at. So what are your alumni doing and what kind of services exist for them at Imperial? Yeah, no, listen, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, there's not all alumni created equally. And I think different schools had different kinds of alumni and, and they serve different sort of uh, segments of sort of the, the workforce. And I think it's great that we've had that diversity. Um, I, if I had to sort of talk about what's happening in the alumni space uh, at Imperial College Business School, uh, I would say that we uh, are under new leadership. We had an absolutely fantastic alumni relations director. Uh, unfortunately, she was scooped up by the team at uh, Cambridge Judge recently. But what that meant was is that we were able to uh, do some scooping of our own, and we hired away uh, a great profile from uh, the London School of Economics. So she's joined us as our new alumni di relations director. Uh, she brings with her, obviously, tons of experience uh, from a quite different kind of institution, still leading Russell Group University. Uh, but lots of fresh ideas and initiatives. Uh, and so we're quite excited about what that new leadership means for uh, our alumni community. I would say that something that's sort of different about what we do from an alumni relations perspective uh, is that, again, part of the uh, positioning of Imperial College Business School is sort of, you know, technology infused business or STEM in business and in London. That's kind of our sort of sweet spot, let's say. So you think about, well, how does that play out as an alumni? So when we, the business school, host alumni events, we don't just host alumni events for business school students. We also invite alumni from the Faculty of Engineering, the Faculty of Natural Sciences, and the Faculty of Medicine as well. There's only four faculties in Imperial College. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we facilitate a lifelong relationship, not just among business school graduates from our 20 or so programs, but also we invite and engage with graduates from the other faculties as well. So you really get that lifelong advantage of STEM and business from Imperial College Business School. And I'd say sort of the, the last is, is providing lots of opportunities for engagement for alumni with our graduates, candidates, and of course, current students. And so up front, we allow our alumni to participate and do many of our MBA admissions interviews. And I think that's quite a, a good way to both make sure our alumni feel like uh, they're participating in the building of those future cohorts, but also they can set realistic expectations with incoming candidates as well. And I think, you know, it's the most fair approach we can take. Obviously, we'd love to have alumni on campus to interact with different student clubs and professional areas of interest groups uh, because they can provide sort of that alumni, uniquely alumni perspective on areas where our students might want to go after their programs. And then, of course, we love to promote their successes. We had one of our uh, MBA graduates who was one of those top 40 under 40 Forbes uh, rankings recently. So we amplify and promote their successes as well. So hopefully through all those activities, the new leadership we have in place and offering something different from alumni network perspective keeps them engaged and also excited about giving back to the institution over time as well. That sounds fantastic. I mean, it's the, the alumni engagement is, is, is everything and whatever your this new person come from LSC, she, she, she's been there for a couple months now or she... She has, I think it's probably been three or four months. Everything seems to go so quick uh, post-pandemic, but she's, yeah. I still consider her a recent addition to the team. She's fantastic. Yeah, like you said, another fantastic institution. It's interesting, some, it's a non-business school, right? More in the political science arena, um, but still the same needs for, for alumni. So look, as we wind down the episode, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what's, what's in store for Imperial in the future? Any new projects, initiatives? What do you want to share? Sure. Yeah, no, listen, I, I think uh, what you'll see from us is a lot of what we're trying to do at the business school uh, is is sort of aligned with the SDGs and certainly Imperial College London is is big into things like climate change and tackling climate change. Uh, and so we sort of thought about, you know, what are our strategic areas of engagement at the business school? How do those align with what the university or what we call the college is doing? How do or what should we be involved in uh, that matters to incoming candidates, current students and graduates? And how do we make 
practical things happen around the research and sort of corporate engagement through our research centers. And so I, rather than say, you know, these are specific things you can expect over the coming 6, 12 or 18 months, I would rather sort of list the five areas of sort of strategic engagement uh, so that you can All keep right, an eye out for you know, activities that might be coming through the pipeline along, aligned with these five areas. So the first and foremost for us is digital transformation. We do have a center for digital transformation. It's a big part of what we're doing today, both from a student experience and delivery perspective, but what we're doing is a business school and a college and certainly what our corporate partners are looking at right now. Uh, and again, the Center for Digital Transformation led our delegation to Davos this year. So they're, they're quite important for us. Entrepreneurship, key part of our culture, not just the business school, but the broader university. And we've got a relatively unique ecosystem around innovation and helping you know new ventures be created, but also helping them scale after graduation. Uh, our finance programs are top ranked, so financial and institutional resilience is another big theme for us. And so, again, the conference that we're here uh, at in Portugal this week is actually co-sponsored between our computing department and the Faculty of Engineering, together with the Brevin Howard uh, Center at the Business School, which is one of the centers focused on finance. Health management and policy, uh, of course, we do have an MSc program in that area, but doing a lot around thinking about what is the future of health. Uh, one of our top faculty members, who is also the president of the Royal Economic Society sat on Macron's uh, COVID uh, sort of task force, let's say. So it's a big area of what we're doing. And then again, I mentioned sustainability before. So expect lots from us in the sustainability space. And certainly with the, the uh, launch of that new uh, carbon capture decarbonization center with Hitachi, uh, both between the business school and the broader university is, is one to watch uh, at the business school as well. Nice. Awesome. That's a lot. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Yeah, that's <laughs> It's a lot. It's very textured. Um, Nalisha, I'm going to punt that over to you. You did talk about all of these initiatives that are constantly happening and evolving, but I wonder if you could bullet point any of the changes on the horizon that, that our viewers would want to know about at GMAC or the, the GMAT in particular. Sure. Vera, especially um, nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I So look, the, for us, the, the things that will... Um, that are on the horizon are kind of you know the continued research data reports and understanding and and, and um, articulating what's happening in the market and uh, and responding to that through you know through our own behaviour as you said through the assessment there are you know there there is um, uh, work to constantly evolve what we're doing we are we have just released something which is not a test but it's a business fundamentals course. Um, so it's to help with the kind of quant, the statistical analysis. It helps kind of people get ready for the business, uh, for business school. They have access to it for like 12 months. It's focused a, a little bit more on the kind of, um, you know, a, a, a um, kind of bite-sized chunks that you can refer back to. So it's kind of a, uh, a, a reference piece. So we're thinking about how we help people navigate not just kind of that that choice and how to get to business school but also how they kind of manage their success um, and again touching a little bit more on the career side as well we're kind of taking input from um, from the recruiters there as well so so look for us I know that I know that you would like some more specifics around the test um, but you can uh, be assured that we will continue to uh, to look at our user experience we will continue to look at how what value people get both candidate and um, and the business school, um, not just the business school. So, you know, it's really important that we kind of, that, that I note that, um, you know, we're looking at how we give more um, to, uh, to to our stakeholders and the industry as a whole. So so that's, um, uh, that's from our side. You mean you're not going to tell me the algorithm code? <laughs> no algorithm I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you on WhatsApp okay. in a minute. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, we already talked about, you know, visiting campus and so forth, the digital opportunities to do so. But just to like finish off, uh, for those who are interested in learning more, um, Joel and Alicia, if there's a, an email address or website you wanted to put, you can put it in the private chat and we can copy it, put that into the comments so people can see on the, on the screen. You can post that for people. It's up to you. Maybe an admissions uh, email address. Uh, um, anything you want to mention that's coming up, any webinars coming up in the next coming days, weeks, whatever, on either side, GMAC or Imperial? Yeah, from an imperial uh, from the imperial side, uh, pretty much uh, I think we have fourteen uh, sort of events happening between the months of July and August. Thirteen of those, so basically ninety five percent of them, are online events. So there's tons of online events you can attend, regardless of your whether you're in your home city and working or on the on holidays or traveling. 
uh, there, there's a lot of online events you can attend over the summer. Uh, so certainly register your interest with us, uh, whether you have a very clear idea of which program and which intake, or maybe just a suite of the programs, or just want to come to the business school for, for something else. Uh, just register your interest with us and we'll, we'll work with you to help you sort of funnel down towards, you know, which program makes the right sense, you know, most sense for you and what timelines you should be looking at both from an application perspective and, and sort of thinking about what comes next as well and sort of planning your, your career more broadly. So again, we have, I have a team of about 45 people and that's their full-time job. So we're here to help. Just get in touch. Yeah, nice. Okay. And Alicia, anything to add before we wrap up? Uh, sure. We have, I mean, look, we have um, a whole host of events happening um, over the summer in person as well as virtual. Uh, we've got quite a lot. Um, uh, we're doing quite a few in, in Europe. And, you know, just uh, from our perspective, um, I mean, I'll be I'll be on the road uh, at, at some of them. But, um, you know, we are, my, most of my team have come from business schools as well. You know, we, uh, they know the sector really well with many of them. I think between us, we counted and we had like almost 100 years worth of experience in business schools, which is a little bit terrifying. Um, but um, yeah, look, we, we do know the sector and, and so do kind of do come and engage with us. We will give our independent opinions on and we know how kind of the the admissions um, processes work and we, we kind of understand the the, the, uh, the business schools uh, well. Um, and look, I, I wanted to just give a, uh, you know, my role is regional uh, director for Europe. So I want to kind of just final final point is just say, look, we have some really, really exciting things happening at um, the institutions in uh, in Europe. It's a really um, the last couple of years have seen some amazing um, things coming out of our programs, our research centres, our institutes, um, and the and the employment and alumni connections. So these um, these communities of what I have observed uh, and I'm and also part of is you know are really something um, yeah are really something special. And I think that there is a huge focus in this region to um you know to do good so uh, i really have a a, a a real um belief that kind of studying within europe and, and i'm not just saying that because you know because uh, because of my role but i do think that um you know some of the, the the things that are happening in these programs and within those alumni communities um are, are exceptional and it's amazing to see so much good happening for the benefit of society as a whole for climate as a whole and for for the planet so it would um i, I would very much welcome uh your conversations and your 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 applications and your input and your uh your thoughts into into joining us and, and, you know, Europe is very much often been leading the way in terms of like data protection, uh, climate, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. So Europe is a, really a great place to study business and other things and to live and work as we know. Um, yeah. Listen, Nalisha, first of all, thank you so much. Very interesting. I've learned so much about GMAC and, and the test and all the other things that surround that you guys do. Um, very nice to meet you. Uh, Joel, great to see you as always. And uh, thank you for all the insight about Imperial. Very cool. Um, just to say, don't forget to tune in next week on MBA Waves. We have another fantastic episode lined up. And for the full programming schedule, schedule check out mbawaves.com for the schedule, as well as past episodes where we have the recordings for this one and all the others. So thank you so much, everyone. Huge thank, so thank you, Eric, Barab, Joel. Pleasant pleasure to spend the evening with you. Thank yes. you, everyone. It was great to catch up. Yep. Have a great afternoon or evening. Bye-bye.